Hello and welcome to Weapons and Warfare. For Straight Arrow News, I'm your host, Ryan Robertson, and welcome to fall, my favorite time of year. Football is back, it's campfire season, and women everywhere are dressing like Han Solo. It's great, and we have a lot packed into this week's episode for you. Like, now that Ukraine is flipping the script on Russia, what's next in Vladimir Putin's illegal war? For that and more, we check in with some of the experts at the Center for European Policy Analysis for their thoughts on Ukraine's Russian incursion. Plus, more new tech from the gang at Anderil. We take a close-up look at the ghost shark as it gets prepped for a major exercise in the Pacific. And we check in with a NATO ally that gets an up-and-close look at their brand new fifth-generation ride. But first, some headlines you may have missed. Next summer will be a busy one for the Air Force in the Pacific. That's after Air Force Chief of Staff General David Alvin announced a large-scale combat exercise called Pack. The goal is to test a series of service-changing concepts announced in February, specifically operating from remote locations with new force structures. We're integrating it into Indo-PACOM's campaign uh, plans and our Pacific Air Force's uh, approach to supporting those. And so we're integrating it into the combatant commander's piece, but we're doing it in a way that's more robust and it's for a longer period of time. So it, it'll be deploying from Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, the, the continental United States. And it's gonna be for about 14 days overall. Air Force leadership sees the exercise as a vital piece in preparing for any potential conflict with China. The name Reforpak has roots in the Cold War era, recalling the once annual exercise known as Reforger, standing for Return of Forces to Germany. Only now, it's in the Pacific rather than Europe. Some new hardware heading the Army's way. That's after General Dynamics Land Systems announced it was awarded a nearly $323 million contract for continued production of the M10 Booker, a new assault vehicle for the Army's Infantry Brigade combat teams. The Booker operates with a four-person crew and features an enhanced thermal viewer, a large caliber cannon, a lightweight hull and turret, and a modern diesel engine, transmission, and suspension system. But it's not a tank. By the end of the deal, the Army will have 504 Bookers in its inventory. All will be sent to light combat divisions in the active duty and National Guard. Finally, some history was made when Army First Lieutenant Mackenzie Corcoran, a Hawaii-based combat engineer, became triple-tapped after completing three of the Army's most demanding courses, Ranger School, Sapper School, and a Hawaii-based Jungle Course. Earning all three is rare for any soldier and quite possibly unprecedented for a woman. Since earning her commission in 2021, Corcoran completed the 12-day jungle operations course, as well as becoming just the eighth woman to complete the 28-day sapper school and the 135th woman to graduate from the 62-day ranger course. While the Army hasn't clarified if any other women have earned all three tabs, there's no doubt congratulations are in order. Great work, Lieutenant. A little more than a month ago, the Ukrainian military served the Kremlin notice it was not afraid to take the fight to Russia on Russian soil. The offensive push into Kursk Oblast no doubt caught Vladimir Putin and the rest of the world by surprise. At the time of this recording, Russia is still looking to find its footing in mustering a viable defense against the Ukrainian incursion. We recently had a chance to sit on a session with the Center for European Policy Analysis, or SEPA, and get their thoughts on Ukraine's offensive, what it means for Russian troops on the ground, and how this phase of the war could be a defining moment. In late August, Ukraine's airborne assault troops released a video said to show scenes from within Russia's Kursk region. The footage also shows Russian troops apparently surrendering to the Ukrainians. A scene analyst Nico Lang says is prompting larger conversations by both those in the fight and watching from afar. The longer 
this goes on, the more questions will be there. What to do with the local population, how to organize uh, uh, the continued work of the villages and cities that are now uh, uh, in the Ukrainian uh, uh, military sphere of influence. Because the city administrations by and large ran away. Uh, the Russians plundered uh, their own shops. This will last for a few days, but what will come after? I just want to say there are from the for the Ukrainian military, there are difficult questions to be answered. For the first time, some of those questions could be coming from Russian citizens. While Putin can keep the news of Russian soldiers dying in Ukraine by the hundreds of thousands out of Russian media, it's a little more difficult when the fight is inside Russia's borders. Ukraine seizing the initiative in the information space in general, I think that's the biggest success of this offensive so far. So far. It changes everything because in German media, like in other European media, it's about Kursk now. It's about Russia bombing its own cities. It's about uh, Ukraine putting pressure and creating problems for Putin. Signs of that pressure can be seen in reporting by the independent investigative Russian outlet Important Stories, which first detailed Putin's decision to send patchwork units comprised, at least in part, with logistics companies, engineers, mechanics, and radar station operators to the fight in Kursk. It's the reason why uh, they have all sorts of radar troops, conscripts, uh, uh, troops that belong to the Ministry of Inter Interior now in Kursk Oblast. The problem with them is that they are not faced with uh, light Ukrainian units. This is Ukrainian brigades, uh, uh, mechanized, some of them heavily combat experienced. So the Russians, very often we see them surrendering because this is something they are not able to deal with, especially not conscripts. In light of that fact, Russia is scrambling to find the troops needed to maintain its push into eastern Ukraine while mitigating the Ukrainian incursion into the Kursk region. Yet in June, Putin boasted of having 700,000 soldiers in the fight, something Pavel Luzin now says seems like wishful thinking at best. Now uh, they're trying to uh, find uh, several thousand troops to counteract uh, uh, Ukra uh, Ukrainian forces in Kursk region. What does it mean? That means that uh, these 700,000 uh, troops do not exist. Uh, and uh, uh, that means Russia uh, faces a uh, lack of manpower. And still, after more than 900 days of war, Neither side is showing any sign of letting up or moving closer to the negotiating table. So what will be the next pressure point? If things hold as they are, it's likely weather will be a factor, in particular, winter weather. I think it's very likely that a large Russian contingent will be outside of Pokrovsk and outside of Torosk, Toretsk on the open field, while the Ukrainians, they might, the cities might be in ruins and the inhabitants evacuated but they will be in the city. And that makes in winter, that makes a decisive di difference if you have to be out there or if you are in a place uh, that is urban. So Russia will have the harder time on the battlefield. But that is months away and things will undoubtedly shift on a regular basis. For example, in late August, the Institute for the Study of War released a map showing Russia was starting to reclaim some of what was lost in Kursk. Whether they can continue to hold it is the most recent question in a war filled with very few answers. Serving you clarity through context, our mission at SAN is to deliver the news straight down the middle. We're different from mainstream media because we spotlight distorted headlines and show you how to do it too. Discover stories that right and left leaning outlets are choosing not to cover by using our Media Miss tool. Download the SAN app and turn on notifications to have straight facts delivered right to your phone or tablet and get straight facts anytime at SAN.com. In terms of things people are afraid of, ghosts and sharks are most certainly on a lot of short lists. Now, I don't know if that's what defense contractor and rural had in mind when it came to naming their advanced extra-large autonomous undersea vehicle, 
but it's certainly caught our eye, and that's why it's our weapon of the week. Meet the Ghost Shark, a product of a 2022 agreement between Andoril Australia, the Royal Australian Navy, and the Defense Science and Technology Group. The goal is to develop an underwater drone capable of providing a variety of mission sets, chief among which is surveillance. And if the name isn't scary, its capabilities likely will be. While specifics have not yet been provided, we do know the Ghost Shark is based on the Dive LD Submersible, developed by Dive Technologies and subsequently acquired by Anduril. For reference, the Dive LD can run autonomously underwater for 10 days and can reach depths of nearly 20,000 feet. Anduril is using technology from its proprietary AUV capability and its Lattice AI-powered software platform to develop Ghost Shark. Make no mistake, extra-large autonomous undersea vessels will be a game changer. They will provide militaries with a persistent option for the delivery of underwater effects in high-risk environments, complementing our existing crewed ships and submarines, as well as our future uncrewed service vessels. Designed to support subsea maritime missions anywhere in the world, the Ghost Shark is a modular multi-purpose platform that can adapt to mission needs and serve as a force multiplier. The reason that we need new and emerging technologies is so that we can create strategic surprise, but also so that we can avoid strategic surprise. With an initial order of three prototypes to be built over three years, the first Ghost Shark was delivered ahead of schedule and on budget. And now, the second prototype has arrived in the U.S., an arrival that coincided with the Rim of the Pacific exercise, also known as RIMPAC. According to the U.S. Navy, it is one of the world's largest maritime exercises held biannually near the Hawaiian Islands to ensure the safety of sea lanes and security on the world's oceans. According to Anduril, having a second ghost shark will also grow the test envelope for the platform because the company has one ghost shark on each side of the Pacific, which are also available for collaborations with other companies or entities. And ask any scientist, the more data points he can get, the better. All in, it adds up to a development that should make the ghost shark plenty scary for any would-be adversary. Time now for comms check, and in April, Weapons and Warfare was fortunate enough to go behind the scenes at the Lockheed Martin F-35 assembly facility in Fort Worth, Texas, to see how America's premier fighter jet was put together. It's a story we were able to bring you in July. One thing we saw but were not able to tell you about, or show you, was Poland's first F-35 during its assembly. Well, as the saying goes, good things come to those who wait. On August 28th, Poland's Air Force and the world got a look at its new fifth-generation fighter. Four years after inking a deal worth $4.6 billion, the first of Poland's 32 F-35As rolled off the line. While the U.S. calls the F-35 the Lightning II, Poland is going with the Hussars, meaning Hussar, drawing inspiration from their cavalry units that were active from the 16th century to the early 18th century. Even though the deal was done two years before Russia's full-blown invasion of Ukraine, Poland, like the rest of the world, watched in 2014 as Russia first invaded Crimea, a fact not lost on one of Poland's deputy national defense ministers, Cesar Tomczyk. Poland is the only country in the world that shares the common borders at the same time with Russia, with Ukraine, and with uh, Belarus. To keep the borders unchanged, we need the best equipment, the best capability, and the best friends. According to a release from Lockheed Martin, the first aircraft, designated AZ-01, will be delivered to the Polish Air Force in December and will be based at Ebbing Air National Guard Base in Arkansas, where Poland will be the first international customer to conduct F-35 pilot training as more of Poland's F-35s roll off the line. 
The F-35s are expected to start arriving in Poland in 2026, making it the first Eastern European country to operate the 5th Gen fighter, with the Czech Republic and Romania expected to follow suit. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. A couple weeks ago on the show, we had a story about F-16s arriving in Ukraine. And in that story, there was a Ukrainian pilot named Oleksy Mess, call sign Moonfish. He was one of the first Ukrainian pilots trained to fly F-16s. And he was in the cockpit on August 26, when Russia unleashed the largest aerial attack against Ukraine since the start of the war. Moonfish was killed defending his country against the onslaught. Too often in this war, in any war, when we hear sets of data like square miles taken, or villages seized, or the number of troops lost, it's easier to talk about it if we sanitize it, if we remove the humanity from the equation. But every square mile taken means more people's homes and businesses are in danger. Every village seized is a community cut off. Every troop loss is a person who will not come home. Alexi Mess helps us remember that because he was willing to open up to the world and share his story. He put into perspective the true cost of conflict, people's lives, which is why it's long past time for the United States and every ally Ukraine has to lift the restrictions on Ukraine using donated arms to hit targets deep inside Russia, not to strike at civilians like the Kremlin is doing, but to take out the military infrastructure Russia uses to perpetuate its illegal, immoral, and unprovoked war against Ukraine. There may be monetary considerations for the U.S., but right now, it's Ukraine bearing the true costs of defeating one of America's oldest and staunchest enemies. That's going to do it for us here at Weapons and Warfare. We want to thank you once again for watching. Please like and subscribe to our social media feeds, and don't forget to tell your friends about us. For senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphics artist Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson, Restrator O News, signing off. Thank you.